Thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the August 8, 2017 meeting of the Milton Conservation Commission. Um, as a matter of uh, formality, uh, we have a couple of announcements. One is that uh, we welcome all comments and questions and citizen participation, but would ask that you uh, identify yourself when you come forward and use a microphone because there is a recording. The second thing is that um, we have a tape recorder going here as well, which is our official record, so that we'd ask that you... Uh, like once again, identify yourself, introduce yourself. And then as a uh, last matter of formality, we introduce ourselves. My name is John Kiernan. Michael Blute. Alfred Doyle. Ingrid Beatty. Kathy Bowen. And we're ready to proceed. We have our quorum. And first on the agenda is an informational uh, presentation, uh, 170 Center Street, Milton. That's the Milton Academy a status report. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, John. For 25 years? Huh? <laughs> I think it is. It 93, is. so we have seven getting in the neighborhood. 25 years. <laughs> it's always good to see you. That's a, good news, I don't have a whole lot of news. Um, my name is Brandon Fagan. I work for GEI. I'm here with uh, Nick Parnell. He's the director of facilities for uh, Milton Academy. Um, we'll kind of make this short. We don't really have an active year. Um, the wetlands are pretty much established. The mobility of the NAPL conditions, I'm assuming you have the report, we do. Um, hasn't changed radically. Um, the water level stayed relatively stable because we've had a wet spring, so we keeping the booms maintained. We will probably be changing the booms out in the fall, um, you know, just to maintain them, but we don't have any sheen showing up in the pond now. The tennis balls all look green and clean, so um, we don't really have a whole lot to report. We did our groundwater monitoring. Everything stayed within the design parameters for the barrier wall. Um, and we haven't had any indication of any mobility. We don't have any product in the recovery wells except for the ones that we do collect from. Um, this year we've only had like 72 gallons of oil and water show up, so we haven't really had a whole lot of recovery. Um, that, that was a question that I had. I, I saw someone here, it looked like 1,765 gallons were on the manifest. Well, so what happens is in, in those certain years, we use a high vacuum extraction uh, truck and we come in and we vacuum out the monitoring wells and the extraction wells. Essentially what we're doing was we're stressing the wells with the expectation that if there's any free product floating around in those barrier conditions that we extract as much as we can. We pay a minimum on the truck because of the way the truck's set up. We have a minimum volume of 1,500 gallons. So we're going to pay for 1,500 gallons no matter what. So when we do that, we come out and stress the aquifer to the volume available to the truck based on the payment. So, so that it, I was correct. It is 1,700. It is 1,700, but it's oil and water, and it's you know in many cases it's mostly water. Um, so, but it, what it does is it draws down the wells. We use it also to clean the wells out. So if we get any debris or any biological buildup or any solids get into the wells from runoff and wash in we vacuum out the bottom of the wells with the vacuum truck at the same time. So essentially, if the water table is at six, seven feet, in order to get down to 12, 13, 14 feet, I gotta vacuum out the well because it's just gotta take the water down to go with it. So it's really more of a maintenance type volume opposed to an actual physical volume of recovery. All right. It's like you're flushing it. Yeah, well, all the way around, I'm vacuuming it. You're, you're flushing yeah, the ground, flushing, flushing it into, it. into yeah. it, so yeah. I'm drawing anything that might be free and around it. Because the barrier is set up with recovery laterals out in front of it, yeah. when I stress it, it pulls in from the whole edge of the barrier. So if there's any free napple along it, by drawing all down, it draws it at the face of the hard barrier, and it creates a drawdown into it. So it's... It's pulling it through the gravel, so it's a good thing. It's essentially just brings back in water. We don't, we're 30 years into the cycle on the Napoli, it doesn't move around. I mean, when you, we excavated it about three years ago, I, we, we came before you, we did some test pits, and the stuff <coughs> came up like glue. Right. It just doesn't have any mobility. It's not going anywhere. It's not going into the gates, which is what we, the gates are designed to do, is to keep the oil back, but it's not actually getting in. And the water quality, based on the analytical, is meeting the GW1 standard, which is basically the state, you know, maximum standard, you know, under a standard as they go. In other words, we're not GW2 and GW3, which GW2 and 3 are for water under a building, and 3 is every water in Massachusetts. GW1 is essentially a drinking water standard. Mm -hmm. We're pretty much in that GW1 category, with the exception of a couple of aliphatics, which is the heavier part of the fuel oil, which 
that doesn't actually even get into the water. Those samples are up gradient within the NAP field, so we don't see a lot of, we don't see any, you know, significant risk related to that. Um, the can, problem can, is we can't close the site because there is an apple still present. Right. Otherwise, the site Well, there will be. I mean, that's indefinite. Right. right. Yeah. Otherwise, the site will go away. I mean, we would go off the registered list, and I wouldn't be sitting before you. Can you give a, a very brief description of what the issue was historically? So, Because the, the public probably doesn't have any sense of what you're talking about. Uh, back in the 1970s, um, there was an oil tank. The, the Milton Academy used to use number six fuel oil to run all their boiler systems and heat uh, through the, you know, the, the 1900s all the way into the, <coughs> the 70s. Uh, the boiler systems then were switched over, and, and now they're switched over to run on diesel fuel and propane. Um, but the six oil release happened in the 70s. They tested the tanks. There were two 20,000 gallon tanks. They went to test the tanks and the tanks leaked. And when they excavated them, they found a product plume. Uh, the product plume was then investigated through the 70s and 80s uh, into, the, into the early 90s when we, we came in under clean harbors. Um, we pulled the active systems out and we put barriers in because the active systems were not controlling the product migration. Um, and we put a barrier gate system in, which is essentially a high-density polyethylene wall, big, thick, heavy plastic vertically placed. And within that barrier, there's gate systems. The upgradient gates allow the water to pass through and under the gates where the, any of the free product from the six oil that released from up the hill runs into the gate wall, into the barrier wall and doesn't allow the product to move by it. Back in the 70s and even into the early 80s, there was free product in O'Hare Pond where they had, you know, black product in the pond. And the old joke, and that's why I mentioned about the tennis ball, is the, the tennis balls were covered in thick black oil. Um, all that was remediated in the early 90s. And when the barrier was put in, we excavated the wetlands. We excavated all the high impact areas, backfilled them all with clean sand and materials. We still had areas where we weren't able to get the remediation completed based on the boundary conditions, so we had some legacy migration. So what you see in the pond is two, two curtains. One's a solid curtain and the other one's a sorbent boom. They were put in as part of the maintenance and management scenario. Milton Academy's personnel do the maintenance on them annually as well as maintaining five gate systems. The gate systems essentially control the migration of the water into them, and then any product that would accumulate into the upgrading gates collected, and then the passive pressure of the water goes under the gate and then relieves itself into a relief gallery on the back side of the barrier wall. Uh, this system's been in operation since 1997 when the RIO was ultimately implemented, and between 97 and current date, we've been maintaining it with the, with the academy support um, to meet uh, what they call the MCP parameters, Massachusetts Contingency Plan CMR 40. Um, and by that, we're here more, we're maintained under the state's regulations under the MCP, but as far as what was originally uh, developed was an order of conditions with the Conservation Commission back in, in, in the days of 97 when we finished the design and process. Conservation Commission then we elected in, in discussion to have a, an annual meeting with with this with them to update any questions you may have so that's how this kind of played out. Thank you. Um, I, I have one question and that is uh, the catch basin next to the tennis court yeah um, that runs into that small detention area right next to right. the hair pond right is that cleaned on a regular basis that's the annual you if you look closely in it there's a story pole in there and we right. excavate that out when the story <coughs> pole sees any sediment loading from the winter we generally don't if it's leaf matter in general livery we don't let you know we don't do a lot to it because especially in the spring we see a lot of um, you know critters essentially you have you know high order mammals you have you know a lot of um, you know, tadpoles, they use it as protective measures because it's a stone-packed area. So um, typically the academy will work on it in the fall, you know, where it, when it, after everything's kind of matured. So but we have, we maintain it. Uh, we haven't had to maintain it in the last year. We did two years ago excavate some stuff out of it. Same catch basin applies to the other outfall, um, the one over by RW2, which is over on the other side of the tennis courts all the way around to where the um, the oil tank building was and that garage is right there in the dipsy dumpster 
right there, there's another one just like that. It's all cut back and maintained so that we can maintain the discharge. Um, because that one over on the other side actually has an oil water separator, you know, an MDC type separator. There's a big tank in the ground. There's a, there's a T on it. And then we have pads in it if there's anything residual left over coming down from up above. And mostly it's runoff. If we get anything from the pavement or things like that, it actually captures it because we don't want any, we don't want any crossover between what's natural occurring from vehicles to affect what's, you know, present, present from the remediation side of it. So when we design that package, we design that gate with actually a, a large tank so that we could actually filter and clean it out. And if we get sediment load and solids from you know road runoff and plowing and everything else, we can actually clean it. So unlike the one over by the tennis court, which takes the flow on the upper part of the school, that one actually has a large MDC tank in it. And that's over actually coming through the um, impact area and that the pipe system is actually about a half a foot below the water table, so if it were to ever leak, you, you, might get, you might get material into it. So that was a protective <coughs> measure. Fair enough. Any questions from commissioners? Uh, any questions from abutters, members of the public, citizens? Hearing none, we thank you very much. Thanks. See you next year. All right. Take care, John. <laughs> <laughs> Good Good Mike. Thanks. Thank take care. All right, that's number one on the agenda. Number two, Blue Hills, this is the Notice of Intent, Blue Hills Reservation and the Ponset River Reservation, Fowl Meadow. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. My name is Amanda Wise with the Massachusetts Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. And I'm Nancy Putnam, the ecologist from DCR. We're yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just said thank you. No, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Give us uh, your presentation. Sure. It's interesting. Well, it's not a fancy one, but um, we're here to present an application for habitat restoration for a rare plant species that's found at the Neponset um, River, Res uh, River Reservation. And we've been um, focused on that plant because it's the only site for that species known in New England. So it's a high priority for the agency, both ourselves and DCR, as well as the New England Wildflower Society. We're working in collaboration with them. So this is a high-ranking site, and we're hoping to basically remove some of the invasive vegetation around that area to improve the habitat to allow that plant to basically prosper at that site, um, allow it to produce more seed, allow more seedlings to grow. So our intent is to work with a list of invasives, which we've highlighted on the first page of our narrative. Some of those are um, woody plants and some are both, um, they're herbaceous, but both perennials and annuals. So we have different techniques for different types of plants. So the woody plants we're going to attempt to control with herbicide applications that's proven to basically move into the root systems more effectively, and we won't have ground disturbance that way, but plants that are annual will be able to hand pull, um, but in the, specifically around the rare plant location, we're gonna have to use really targeted herbicide application to prevent any disturbance of those root systems because they're so intertwined. Um, we've used similar techniques at other sites on related plants. There's a, a relative of this that occurs in similar habitat. We've worked in Concord, uh, Massachusetts on that site and have had really great results. Um, we did through study plots using these herbicide techniques um, to control, on that site it was specifically glossy buckthorn. Um, when we made the, when we, um, through the test plots controlled there, we had really good release of the rare plant we were hoping to protect and even saw increases of up, or upwards of 500% for that population. So not, you know, that's release of seedlings, that's increase of flowering um, production. So um, really good improvements there and with little or no loss to the population itself, so. Can you give us a, a percentage of, the, there, there are 94 acres at issue here, correct? Sure. Um, can you give us a percentage of, of how much of the invasive species in terms of coverage and how much of that coverage are you going to destroy? Sure. Um, yeah. You want to chime in on that? Yeah. Well, why don't you first, you know, um, Amanda's here kind of representing the, the most, the phase one of this project, which is to protect this rare plant population. And um, so why don't you talk about how much 
invasive control you're planning to do for that particular population? And then I can chime in about phase two, which is really a, more of a DCR effort. A larger, a, a larger much area. larger effort. And yeah. I can try to explain so what you, we're thinking. Could you describe in terms of the plant that you're trying to protect the quantity that we're talking about? Understanding mm -hmm. that it's a smaller piece of the whole the quantity that we're talking about and how diversely located? I mean, are we talking about one localized area or are we talking about much. Um, a longer kind of Yeah, I mean, it, right now it grows, it grows along the walking path or the old um, access road sure. through Falmetto. Yep. Um, that site, the plants are basically restricted to the edge of that path right now. And that's because the vegetation's so overgrown that the only place they can get light is along that border. Okay. So they're persisting there. It's a very linear population. It's only in those bands along those edges. Obviously, it can't grow in the center of the footpath very well because of activity. Mm -hmm. So it's not a huge area. It's pretty discreet. So our intent would be to work directly around the plants and slowly work out. And we may even do that in phases. So to see, you know, do our first treatment to see how they respond. Maybe not wait a full season, but we can do it in increments throughout a season. And as Nancy had mentioned, this is part of a bigger vision. You know, at first we sort of saw this narrowly through focusing on the plant, but it doesn't, for, for our eyes, through ecologists' eyes, it makes sense to sort of see this in a broader perspective if we can make more um, concerted effort to, to control the, the issues at large there. So if you want to... In on the yeah, well, I think one of the things they're trying to get at is the acreage affected by this project, and, and um, it's, it's difficult to estimate that. Um, I think what we, you know, when, when I heard that Natural Heritage wanted to, you know, uh, protect this plant as soon as possible, you know, we decided to file this notice of intent. And so that was the impetus for the notice of intent is the com increased competition from other non-native invasives of this particular population. And so that, and so Natural Heritage would be doing the treatments themselves, the staff at Natural Heritage. And, and that would probably be less than an acre right. in wetlands and buffer zone. It's all, pretty much all in either riverfront area or buffer zone or on the, the edges of wetlands. Treatment is less than an acre. Yes. Oh, good, okay. Because yes. all, all I could envision was like yeah. all of Fal Meadow. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. They're talking. No, they're ta they're talking about um, phase one. Or phase one. We're talking about phase, just about phase one, one for protection of this rare plant. An acre, uh, less than an acre. Yeah. Okay. And and usually how these treatments are done that I've observed <coughs> is that they um, depending on, especially out there I think for protection of this rare plant. They sometimes use a plant sprayer and actually just spray the, le the individual leaves of the non-native invasive or wipe it with a glove. So it's very targeted. I, I thought this plan was to wipe it with a glove to stay away from overspray. Is, isn't right. that the plan? Right. We have a couple different techniques, but as Nancy's saying, it's very targeted, so you're not going to see... It's not like when roadside treatment is done or it's all brown. Mm -hmm. It's very targeted. Either we're cutting a stump and treating the stump, so you'll never see... Nothing will be affected around it. We'll just kill that one plant, or we'll swipe the, the plant that has foliage on it that's low to the ground, and you'll right. just see you know one plant will brown out, but everything else will remain green. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to have bare ground situation. That, that was our concern, well, my right. concern. But remember the MBTA down on Elliott Street? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they wiped out. We everything. didn't know what they did. They, oh, wouldn't, right. they wouldn't fess yeah, up. We, Bugs, yeah, grass, everything. We never found everything. out what yeah. the, what the never found agent out was, but it persisted for years. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple questions. Um, and well, one question is sort of a historic question. I think I recall that there was a, a beetle effort with regard to the purple loosestrife, it was at the Blue Hills. I believe it was also at Fal Falmetto. And what was the outcome of that? Was that successful in in damping down proliferation of uh, the purple loosestrife? What happened there? Well, the <coughs> loosestrife beetle program has been going on for some time, and that's been successful. They, it's a host-specific beetle, a weevil, that bores into the plants and only affects purple loose strife. So that's been released all over New England and much of the United States where that plant is an issue, and they've found it effective. Effective in that it doesn't 
the plants become in sync with each other, the insects and the plants, so you'll never completely remove the loose strife, mm -hmm. and the beetle will never become so abundant that, you know, like I said, eats everything, and they sort of find a balance, so we get a reduction of the loose strife and the beetles in sync with that species, so it becomes sort of part of the ecosystem, so to speak. So from my understanding, it's been successful. I've seen it work well in reduction of loose strife, which is great for our wetlands, um, but we don't have any data coming out of that, that program. It's usually funded at a larger level at USDA. APHIS is sort of doing the research on that. So, uh, My big concern is about glyphosate. I mean, it's always been regarded as pretty heavy-duty, napalm-like <laughs> <laughs> uh, chemical warfare. Sure. Um, and data in the past year and year and a half, as I'm sure you are all aware, is uh, even more disturbing. Mm -hmm. You know, with it showing up in plasma levels of grade school kids and, uh, and terrible for aquatic species like salamanders and frogs and things like that. So have you, has anyone thought of alternatives? And if so, what are they? And then secondly, uh, and I really do want to hear about alternatives because I think we do need to talk about them because the downstream effects of the widespread glyphosate use is really intolerable, I think. Um, and if we do end up having to use it, uh, as you described, the cut and paint, the cut site is probably the best way to go at it rather than the spraying or even the wiping. Mm -hmm. You know, really the cut and, and paint where it gets into the roots and kills the plant in a very, very, very localized way, if at all possible, would be the way to go. If you can comment sure. on that. Yeah, we're very aware that glyphosate's a big concern. It's a, for me, you know, in my personal life, it's a concern. It's, it's a really big issue in the food production model that we have right now. It's in a lot of things that we eat, and I think that's one of the main drivers of what we're seeing. So we do take that to heart in the work we do, but at the same time, we know that cutting or mowing is not effective alone. We know it's one of our few options in habitat management, and we try to use it sparingly, but a lot of the normal disturbances that would occur in these habitats that would help them persist in the landscape don't happen anymore. The natural fires, um, natural wind throw from storms, other things that would normally occur to keep these spaces open don't happen. And then with invasive plants coming in, it becomes even more difficult to keep the systems going. So we have to use the products that we can. Glyphosate is one of the most benign that we use. It does bind to soil and, and does break down the fastest of the products we use. Um, that doesn't diminish the concern, and we understand that. Um, but in terms of the effectiveness of it, we, we need a combination of being able to use both the cut and paint directly to the stem and foliar, because what we find happens is if you cut the stem and treat once, sometimes there's enough root mass in that plant to re-sprout, and you'll have a flush of stems. And the, the swiping treatment actually uses a lesser amount of the product, and it's more effective in some ways, though you ha may have more chance for non-target impact. But it's with two treatments, using both first the cut and then potential to follow up with a swipe treatment or a very targeted um, spray treatment, you can basically have 100% control within the two years, roughly. Whereas if you only did cut paint, there's a high chance that you won't be able to kill the stems because you'll just keep getting a flush of that plant and you won't have any material to recut to retreat. So, so and you have to retreat anyway. Is it do. safe to say that you will not spray? We would like that option, but it would be minimal. I think we could use some different techniques, like we said, swipe um, with our hands. That's sort of mimicking a spray, but we're not going to be using backpack sprayers. I don't think we mentioned that in our plan. I mean, um, aerosolization is... I think a big problem. Right. <laughs> yeah, around, directly around the plant, we're envisioning just the swiping and the and the cutting and painting of the stumps. Um, that's our vision right now. I don't envision like backpack sprayers or anything like mist sprayers out there. So, is there an alternative to glyphosate or to herbiciding? To no, glyphosate. glyphosate. There are other chemicals. So you had some concerns about impacts to aquatics, uh, specifically um, salamanders and frogs. 
We, we prefer to use a product that's aquatic safe. Um, that would be, so there's several formulations of glyphosate. Some that have surfactants, which are, is the product that would affect aquatic life, mm -hmm. and those that don't. So the, the products that don't have the surfactant in it are safe for aquatic settings. So that's our preferred product so that we know that there won't be any impact. Um, and we can add additional surfactants, if need be, that are uh, aquatic approved, so they're safe to use around fish and salamanders yeah. and other animals. Is anything that has a shiny leaf or skin on the leaf, this, you need a surfactant, or so, it's not gonna stick to your target. Right? right, yep. So you don't wanna, our, our goal is to not use herbicides ineffectively, mm -hmm. so to have the proper, you know, have the use of the right tools in our toolbox so that we can make this effective and as fast as possible. So a couple, so when you talk about cutting and dabbing, right. do you, you're, so you, you find that that actually, you don't get any draw in or very, you don't get very much draw in of that into the root system because of, because you're basically deactivating the plant where if you apply it on the leaf, you get more draw in because the plant's still active. Is that the descriptive or? They usually occur at different times of year. Yep. So when we do the, the stump treatment where it's direct to the cambium, it, if we do it in the fall, it works very well, and we do okay. get drawdown. But sometimes if there's a hot, you know, depending on the size of the root system sure. and how much product that plant takes up, which depends on humidity and temperature and a bunch of factors, we may get some re-sprouts. Um, but because of the, so the, the foliar treatment I speak of with the swiping, putting the product at a low percentage on the leaves actually, because it's so much more surface area, that's why it's more effective. Okay. And that usually occurs during the growing season when the plants are more active. So they're both effective, but they're effective in different ways. And you mentioned earlier about the fact that the, the roots are intertwined so much, that's why you don't want to pull them in, in the localized areas, but you don't find that you have any kind of bridging of, of, the, of the herbicides? Oh, between the, root between systems? the root systems, or yeah, I mean that m more happens when plants are clonal, or there's plants that are sharing nutrients between each other, and the plants that are in this setting, we don't find that happening. Okay. So the the most likely occurrence would be the the non-native invasive species would have maybe merged roots, but this rare plant would not likely be merged with the root systems of these other plants. Okay. They're not hosts to one another. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I'm. I'm concerned, uh, first of all, I have great respect for your agencies, and, and this is a, sort of a team effort, um, and I, so I applaud you. To some extent, you're asking us to trust your discretion, um, and I, from the legal world, there's something called Chevron deference, and I'm well familiar with that. Uh, and it, what it does is it has, you know, the courts are very uh, deferential to the agencies whose expertise it is to do what you do. Um, and I'm, I agree with that deference, but I'm a little concerned, and particularly um, I think in, within the last month or so, uh, one of the national news programs, I don't know if it was Good Morning America or the Today Show, uh, had a program on glyphosate. And um, I, I think it was a California Prop 65 issue. And of course, California, I know, is, you know they're, they're, they're uh, super sensitive to these things. But uh, the report did suggest that that is a carcinogen. And I, I, I go back to Ingrid's request for a alternatives analysis. Is there anything that you could use that would replace that? And I don't know, and I'm not trying to put you into a corner. I, I confess my own ignorance in this area. But is there some kind of a chemical alternative? And uh, when you go to aquatic safe, we had the same issue, and there's somebody here seated, and I may end up asking her the question too, um, because they're here for a, um, a permit that DEP has approved, uh, and it has to do with aquatic treatment. And uh, I think glyphosate was an issue for them as well. So I, I'm just trying to get as much data here as possible. Sure. So to, to speak to alternative chemicals, if we're talking herbicides, there are other products. The second most benign product we could use would be a triclopyr base. We would use that in summer months, so that's something we could explore as an option. Um, we usually default to glyphosate because it's even, it's like one, one minor step down. 
Um, it's the most safe for the applicator. Uh, triclopyr has a little more hazard for the applicator, which is not concern for the public, but the people applying it has more chance for an irritation to the eyes for the person mixing. So we sort of step up with the most safe to the next level and go from there. So in terms of environmental impact, uh, triclopyr is similar, but it has a higher chance to move in sandy soils. Um, we don't see this as being necessarily an issue here, but it's something we could potentially review if there was concern moving forward with glyphosate. Um, in terms of speaking to it being listed as a carcinogen, that's from a World Health Report. And some of the science, just to be clear, was redacted from that original report. Um, I can't speak to all of the science that went into it, but there is some controversy behind it. Um, and we know that it'd be great to see that re-reviewed in, in a non-political um, lens uh, through a, a different setting. So we understand California's made some rulings on that, which I think is good for the food industry, but it has impacts on habitat management, which may be negative. I'm not sure I feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's not an easy issue for me personally either. Um, um, I, I'm a big advocate of hand pulling whenever we can and manual removal um, of the plants whenever we can and just repeated removal each year because obviously they, they often come back. And, um, and the contractors that DCR has been using often use glyphosate as well. They feel it's the safest of the chemicals um, for um, chemical treatments, and my, my understanding, and I, I'm much more of a field ecologist than I am um, of a herbicide person, so, but my understanding is that a lot of it depends upon the species that you're targeting, whether you can use manual removal or not. Um, for instance, swallowwort, which is really a huge problem at the Blue Hills, um, if you try to hand pull it, it breaks off, and that you don't get the root system. And so, um, you know, we, we do tend to use um, glyphosate on swallowwort because it works incredibly well. And we've been using that at Mount Tom for years. Natural Heritage staff has been um, treating this one stand um, of hickory hop hornbeam forest in Mount Tom that's, that's full of rare plants. And what we do is we go out there and we flag the rare plants and then we flag with a different color, the swallowwort, and then um, with a little spray bottle they just target the leaves of the swallowwort. And they've had 95% reduction of the swallowwort over like five years. Mm. Uh, it's worked very, very well, and yet all the rare plants are still there, and then the, uh, the other natives are all still there. So the contractors that I've hired in the past sometimes feel like it's safer to use the, the diluted mixture for the leaves to apply it to the leaves instead of doing the cut stem because you do use less chemical in the end because it's such a lower concentration. Mm -hmm. and that You have to use a much stronger formula if you do a cut stem treatment. But it's, it is a difficult issue. When we first talked about this in the field concerning this one rare plant population, I suggested that we do as much hand pulling as possible. Um, so, I mean, I still think we can do that as long as we're not so close to the rare plant that we would, right. you know, have a d damage to the rare plant. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in general, I think it's been a difficulty for public agencies on a large scale to use manual removal because it's so time intensive. Mm -hmm. But we use it for garlic mustard uh, across our properties um, and because, you know, it, it works really well to hand pull garlic mustard, even, but it has such a big seed bank, you have to do it for six or eight years before you see a, an impact. Is there a way to, um, uh, to do this in stages? Um, of for instance, I know you want the option of spraying, and I think our preference would be the, the hand and, and the paint. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can you try it that yeah. way and see if it works? Yeah. Absolutely. And then come back so that if we if we said okay, it's a, it's a great project, and mm -hmm. so don't don't misunderstand me. I'm just concerned that 
uh, we don't go overboard with something that is controversial mm -hmm. in terms of the herbicide in use. Mm -hmm. And I would prefer to have it not sprayed, but the hand paint at a lower concentration uh, and the cut and paste at a higher concentration. I think the cut and paint is a higher concentration, yes. correct? Um, but it's not going to it's not going to get away from you. Right. And notwithstanding the fact that you prefer to have that um, discretion, could you live with it if we said just do the, the hand wipe and the cut and paint? I think that would be a great compromise. Right. Yes. And then if you you know if it doesn't work, then you can come back and we can reconsider it. And I'm not trying to mm -hmm. put form over substance here. It's just you've got to do several rounds anyway. It, it would be very rare for it to work after one application. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. it's a it's an know, annual second and third mm -hmm. year type operation oh, yeah. anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, and you made that clear through your narrative. Okay. Um, so let me explain why for the map of our project we included all of Blue Hills for this and that's within Milton is is that um, you know we've been really trying to gear up at DCR to try to um, manage the invasives that have taken off in our highest priority sites um, and so this in the last three months we've had a contractor develop regional management plans for our invasives on DCR land across the state. And so I've just received a draft for the South Region plan just in the last week. And so it, it outlines the top 10 priority sites that we would want to target for invasive control. And of course, Blue Hills and Falmetto are, is one of those sites because of all the rare species that we have in the priority natural communities. Um, and so the, but we, I don't have specific plans um, for work in the Blue Hills that's within resource areas. We have started a little bit of work at the summit of Great Blue Hill that's way outside of your jurisdiction um, that we did get approval from Natural Heritage for um, to try to um, control the swallow wart. But in general, we haven't you know, and we've proposed to you last month a little bit of work associated with Pine Tree Brook, but um, concerning that other project. Uh, but in general, I haven't formulated plans yet, but what I was thinking would be helpful is if we got an order of conditions that ha was conditional so that you, so that when we have specific plans we could bring them to you and you could evaluate those plans, but we wouldn't have to file a whole new notice of intent. You could still discuss them in your meetings. We could come in and talk to you about them. We can negotiate. But we were, um, you know, wondering if we could have kind of an overall order of conditions for this type of activity and then bring in specific targeted plans when we formulate those. And, and, how, how many acres we would do in the next f three years, I don't think we would do a lot because I have one crew of two or three people doing this and they're working across the whole state. So <laughs> they move all over. So it's not, you know, they'll probably only be at Blue Hills or Falmetto, you know, once a year for a few days or something or a week. It's not, not like we're planning to wipe out everything at Blue Hills. and. You know, but, you know, it does concern us when we go out there that, you know, that especially that section of Neponset and Falmetto has acres and acres of um, Phragmites, for instance, and, um, yeah. and then the buckthorn is taking over and, you know, so, you know, we're, we're just trying to get started to figure out how to address this in the most um, environmentally sensitive way. And, and I know there, are, there aren't any easy solutions for Phragmites either. And that's no. a difficult one. Napalm. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, that, that actually sounds like a, a workable plan. Could, could we do it um, so that you, you know, sort of have broad authority, um, but you come back to us uh, for so, approval for a particular targeted plan? Yeah. And if so, could we do it by acreage? Sure. I mean, that, that you're not going to affect more than three acres. All I could envision oh, yeah. when I read it was 94 acres. Oh, so. And if it doesn't work, <laughs> we've got yeah, a, that's horrible. a landing no. strip or something. No, no, no. Uh, would, should, would that work if we did it by acreage? Sure. Yeah, yeah however, however you're comfortable doing it. Usually, like for instance, I just 
applied to natural heritage to do a little bit of, have our invasive crew do a little bit of work next week at Middlesex Fells that's in priority habitat and it's up on a mountain top and you know it's it's probably half an acre but it's probably only 50 plants scattered over a half an acre so it's not it's just like one plant here one plant so it's not like like spray right. <laughs> so um yeah i mean for for us it's often you know they'll work in a specific area that's a high priority but often the plants aren't very dense in that area, unless you're dealing with a monoculture like, like we have with um, Phragmites. So it, however you want, however you're comfortable conditioning it in a way that's clear for all of us, I think is just fine. So, so, so if there are developments, particularly with respect to the, the science involving uh, uh, glyphosate, yeah. that, that would be important. We'd be able to take a look at it again, yeah. um, you know, sometime within the three-year period for what is Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it, actually, we had had a conversation before you came in about the, the bugs and mm -hmm. the purple loosestrife, mm -hmm. whatever it was, seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our concern was at that time that, okay, when the bugs stop eating the purple loosestrife, mm -hmm. what are they going to eat? That's been a concern uh, of mine, too, with this <laughs> biocontrol in a general sense. Um, but I wasn't here when that program was started, so I haven't been involved. But I know that there has been a control um, it, there's been biocontrol for a mile a minute as well at Foul Meadow, and, and we haven't been involved with that. That's also with um, the Department of Agriculture. Um, so, right. and uh, they release a little weevil, I think it is, right? Mm -hmm. For the mile, that just eats the mile a minute. There's still a lot of mile a minute out there, so, you know. But yeah, I, I'm certainly concerned about that, but it sounds like other agencies have been doing this for a really long time. Okay. But I, I don't have control over, over that. Um, could I ask a question, and mm -hmm. it, it might be a little bit uh, unusual, but we do have another um, item. Kelly, can I ask you uh, what your opinion is on use of glyphosate <coughs> with aquatic application? So generally, um, we'll use Rodeo, which is a glyphosate product, product, but that doesn't have the surfactant in it. And I routinely test for both glyphosate and triclopyr at other sites for other clients of mine in groundwater and sometimes in surface water. And I have to say that they're um, particularly glyphosate, um, I've never found in groundwater. So I, I know it's used at these facilities because of, um, and it's been used historically, um, and, and I share your food issues because I come from a family where we basically can't eat any food. We're allergic to everything, so you're always looking for what's the next reason why maybe we're always so allergic. But, um, but we're not seeing it in, in uh, migrating into groundwater. Um, and, and so I would say, based on my experience, um, that that's, that's probably the only tool that they have to do this. I would just ask you, how many individuals of these plants do you have? What, how big is your population at this point in time? trying to remember what our last count was. I want to say it's fewer than 200 and maybe even less than 100. And this yeah. is the only occurrence in New England. So, so that's not a huge population and... Um, Won't be much chemical and, either. And so maybe one of, the, one of the ways of looking at it would be use the chemicals in those areas that are closest to the population mm -hmm. as it is now and then use more mechanical methods further away where you have less risk of the roots interfering. Um, until such time as you're really lucky and then it propagates and, and you know it spreads further but then your population will be so limited so that might be one way of looking at it you could feel more comfortable and the other thing I would just ask is I'm assuming that your applicators are licensed and, and so they have to keep track of that there are records they're filed annually um, according to the applicator and their license so it isn't it isn't kind of like my husband going to Home Depot and spreading something <laughs> the, these people are trained so given all of that, I would think it's, it's reasonable. Um, and then only one more comment, and that is that the purple loosestrife at Wollaston has decreased dramatically, dramatically, um, with the release of the, um, of the beetle or the weevil, whichever it is. Um, so that's been a great help at Wollaston. It used to be beautiful and purple. It's a little less beautiful and purple, but, um, <laughs> but I think that's a good thing. All right, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm.
Sure. I just want to get all the resources that we've got sitting yeah. in the room. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm not sure that, that we've captured all of the conditions. <laughs> uh, if, I know you've been taking notes, Kathy, but one of the, uh, one of the big ones is we can limit this um, in terms of using hand application and uh, cut and paint as opposed to spray. And the second one is to use it um, within a, a limitation of acreage. And I just want to make sure you've got enough discretion. And would, I just made it up three acres. You're not going to do more than three acres? Sounds fair. That's fine. So you want that in the order of three acres? Yes, right. And then we'll do it, I think at your suggestion, that we'll do it some kind of a, uh, if there are different targeted uh, areas, areas yes. that you can come back and, come and back. give us a targeted plan. Yeah, for absolutely. Food. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that would that as a condition yes. if there's other targeted areas they need to come before the commission? Yes. But as part of this the larger filing. yeah, the part of the larger yeah. future phases. Yes. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Any any anything else? Any other comments from members of the public? Um, did we did we prescribe no spray? Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Just a cut and paint and the, and the hand wipe. Yeah. But so you want no spraying won't be allowed. Correct. Correct. Do you need anything else on the um, adherent material, the surfix, uh, surf, what's it called? Surf surfactant. surfactant. Yeah. Um, so that you will use the non-surfactant formulation as you get closer to the water, is that correct? For the whole project, we'll use aquatic safe products. For the whole project? Yep. Okay. All right. You get that one, Kathy? Mm -hmm. Perfect. So does the no spraying, is that for all of the areas at Blue Hills, or is that just for this phase one? The reason I ask is I think I'm not sure if that's feasible if we were to target a big monoculture, say, of Phragmites, for instance. So I, but that's not what we're doing for phase one. Yeah. That, Correct. That's, so we'll we'll limit this to, to phase one. Okay. Yeah, although I remember a report from the golf club saying that they had great success with the cut and paint. Yeah, it to works. To knock back the Phragmites in specifically. Right. This oh, I agree. Ago. But if you're trying to do an acre or so, it's so expensive that I'm sure we couldn't mm. get the funding. I understand. Because it's each stem. Yeah. It goes everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. All right. Well, with those conditions, we'll any other conditions? When we come to it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, we can talk about it in, if we <laughs> tackle it. If we decide right. to even tackle it. And that's doable from your perspective that with those great. conditions. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, with those contingencies, is there a motion to uh, issue the order of conditions? So moved. So, second. Any discussion? All in favor? None opposed. We're all set. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. All right. Good program. <laughs> All right, next on the agenda is uh, Order of uh, Condition Enforcement Order 131 Elliott Street. Hey, good evening, Steve. Good evening. How's it going? Uh, I sent a, uh, a Steve Connolly applicant, 131 Elliott Street. Um, I sent a, an email to Kathy during the week. I think you should have it in your packet. And um, just a few things that we'd like to get cleaned up before we move forward with the transfer of the property and uh, demolition and the, and the new development. So, uh, Mr. Kidd, I don't know how you want to proceed with this, go through one by one or if any particular order. Uh, it just to, um, to put in context, uh, this is the Hendry's project? Yes. And uh, 131 Elliott, sometimes known as Zero Central Avenue as right. well. And there are actually two permits that are existing. Do they still exist or? Yes. Okay. They do. So there was one permit, there was a 40B, there was right. one permit for a, a mixed-use development. Right. And then DEP um, had written a letter indicating that they wanted you to pull one permit, or they were going to pull one permit. Right. What happened to that? Uh, we, we requested an extension. Uh, we don't have a formal date, but they did agree to extend it past the original date of the end of July. Okay. So I just haven't had the formal response yet, but we are, both permits are still active, right? Okay. Um, and then th th there's been no conveyance of land that's still pending. Not yet, right. All right. So what w brings us here tonight is the enforcement order that was the result of the taking down of the legacy oak tree at the corner of Central Avenue and Elliott Street, right. correct? And I think originally that enforcement order 
uh, provided for a one 12 inch tree to be to replace the legacy oak with one 12 inch tree and five six inch trees. Right. And they couldn't fit on the site, mm -hmm. uh, so the idea was that we could uh, find other places to put them within the town. Sure. When we issued the second permit for the mixed use development, uh, we addressed part of that in Fourth Road, and we took the 12 inch tree and we waved our wand and, and made it a six inch tree and put it on site to accompany your landscape plan for the mixed use development, okay. correct? Uh, well, that's the first piece. It, it, um, the language in the order for the mixed use, it didn't specify six inch. It just said largest and survivable. And I'd like to have six inch as designated that that's what it is to, for that special condition. Okay, that, yeah, that, that's easy because my impression was that we had taken the we 12 had and about. went to six. Right. All right, and then that, that left, the enforcement order still had uh, five, six inch trees. Correct. And, and that brings you here today, you think that's difficult um, and well, costly. I'd like to get something a little more manageable because what's, what, what we've found is once you go above four or four and a quarter for a caliper of a tree that they have to go off site, any of the nurseries, and they have to locate these species and truck them in. And typically they get trucked by the, you know, they get a certain amount every year or every quarter, or however they do it. But it becomes very onerous for us to produce that many of them. So I was seeing if, if, um, if you'd revisit that and if we could get to a caliper tree that I could access at these nurseries without having to go out and search for them. So. Well, from what you just said, uh, if it's four inches or less, could you live with that? Yes. Okay. Um, and just for the public's benefit, in the past, we have worked with a, a sort of a virtual tree inventory because sometimes people will cut down a tree and then we have a three to one ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it was a six to one because of the size of the legacy oak, but right. typically it's three. Sometimes there's not enough room to place the three. So we have this virtual inventory um, where trees are designated and sometimes people uh, pay money into the revolving fund designated for those trees to be planted elsewhere in the town. Mm -hmm. And we've done that at Turner's Pond as an example, uh, that we've had trees planted there. So we've actually, and I call it a virtual because sometimes the trees haven't even been purchased yet. Right. So I, I think that the, the commission is open to having some kind of, a, even though that we don't have a place yet for the five trees. Yeah. Uh, so the issue then becomes, can we reduce it to make it more manageable from the six inches to, you said you could live with four inches. Correct. So I'm just trying to get you know, the, a sense of the, the commission as to whether or not we can uh, come to some kind of accommodation. I, I know that this was a, a, a significant issue when it happened. It goes back, I don't know how many years now. Uh, it's over uh, six. <laughs> six is years? Is it really? Yeah, wow. it is, yeah. Oh. Wow. That, that goes back a ways. Yeah, it does. So I think it's probably time to move this to a conclusion. But uh, is there any, does anybody have a sense of whether or not we could move off the uh, five, six inch trees and move to a, a smaller caliper tree so that they, they can, you know, don't have to go off site and truck them in. I, I would rather, I mean, I would rather, understanding that we don't want to, the difficulty of finding the caliper tree, but maybe a more appropriate solution would be to say um, the largest available, not less, not less than four. So, so that we're not. Available where? I don't know what's what you say the range, but I'm just saying that. If you pay enough money, you can get a big tree. <laughs> well, no, I, okay, well, okay, to find what that is, okay, but but in terms of just saying, rather than going in saying it, it can be, it's going to be, we're looking for, rather than saying we're looking for six inch trees, we're going to say well four inches is acceptable, but come to find out, well they actually have sixes of the same tree that we that we're talking about someplace locally available. We should take we should take advantage of that because there isn't if it's locally available. Um, uh, that I way, I don't even think the local. I mean, I think we have to define locally because I think <laughs> the local to Milton nurseries don't even. They're not even going to have four inch. They're not even going to have four inch. I don't think so. So what's a reasonable distance? Well, in terms of the 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 dimension, the distances that you're talking about, what is your what are you finding in terms? Are you talking about kind of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island kind of range? Massachusetts. Uh, I've been dealing with uh, Blue View out of Norton. They're a reputable nursery. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, that's where I've been getting my information. I've been dealing with a woman by the name of Bridget down there. She's been very helpful for us. And um, so yeah, that's what she, she said. Once you get over that four, four and a quarter caliper, whatever they have, sometimes, depending on the season, depending on what their stock is and what the demand is, maybe there is a four and a half or even a five foot one, five inch one on site. 
but typically they clear out their inventories and that's that's the maximum that they that they're readily available the fours the yeah. four foreign quarters yeah and also well, i was been speaking with the uh, town administrator and he's been working with the shade tree advisory committee right and they've been doing a study of the town inventory and what's needed and maybe that's a way to go if if you were amenable to it to have these trees available to them and, and again have something that i could get at the nursery and, and make it available when they determine where they need trees yeah. planted once they have their work done the survey done so we're, we're aware of that group um and we're in support of that group and we do have the bank the virtual bank and the mm -hmm. tree contributions that are happening mm -hmm. and it's our assumption and it has been our assumption that we're going to be contributing to that okay and filling in voids in specific to the tree in specific to the enforcement order the hope was that the trees we're talking about are going have the potential to be legacy trees and they would go in key locations around town mm -hmm. the corner of a, a park you know, the library tree is down but some you know some place that in notable locations that have the ability to grow to 100 150 years mm -hmm. um so i'd like to think that the trees that we're talking about are are a larger more not, not a lot not necessarily larger in terms of size but larger in terms of potential mm -hmm. um, than the trees that we're talking about for the median you know the medium of, of a you know the right. strip of the street right. didn't didn't we have in the original enforcement order that black oak or we something? had uh, we're going to try to get a black oak for the site yeah that's what you guys had right. okay. and then we're also looking at um, hackberry and uh, you had red oak on the enfor the enforcement order had red oak and hackberry trees and that's what I've been looking for. So. Okay, yeah. but um, would, would that satisfy your definition of a, of a legacy tree that has the yeah, capacity it, to, to last me, 100 years? Right. It's yeah, exactly. It's, we're looking for trees that are going to be notable trees that can be planted in key locations around town, as opposed to being planted on the median strip. And and in terms of the four inches, I don't have a concern about the four inches or the six inches. But if if a six inch is available, then we should be we should be getting the largest reasonable tree that, that's available. As you say, at certain times the what did you say, Blue View? Yes. That, that Blue View has larger trees available, and if if it comes to be depends that, on the timing. Yeah, so based on the timing, right. and and if it turns out that the, that the timing works and we can get end up with a six inch tree, at at you know at normal process, that seems reasonable to me. I don't think that we should just say that it all naturally drops down to four just because the timing might might not work. You know, we can say that that's acceptable if the timing doesn't work. Does that seem? I don't know how you're gonna. I know how you're gonna write that, but well, no, just I, in I, terms I, of availability yeah, at the time, you know. Right. I, yeah. I know what you're driving at, and I I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. Whatever's on site at the nursery. Right. But if we can't plant it, I mean, are we really talking about a financial contribution? I mean, if we don't have a place to put it right now, so that's why I, I use the term virtual inventory. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we really talking about having a financial contribution that would be sort of the equivalent of? These trees. I, I, I'd look at that, uh, but it, what I want to do is, if I can get uh, get the designation of what it is, and then we can make a determination on whether to have a credit at the nursery for those forage trees, so that they can draw from them when they're ready, and I can call it whatever that is, yeah. or you know, either or. I mean, I'd, I'd have to look at that. I, don't, I think just to have them readily available, and when they're ready to plant, whenever they have in certain. When the shade tree committee makes their determinations where trees are needed, maybe right. they consult with you to see where you want these particular ones. Right. We can drop these four trees. You know, this, the key here is just the, it's, it's, it's to make sure that we can have something that we can put our hands on. And I know that I can get that. My understanding from dealing with blue, blue view is I can get these four inch trees. Right. I know I can do that. Sure. And that's why I want to be able to perform on this without having to come back. So. Right. There are a couple of other elements that I think are important that favor moving in this direction. One was soil adaptability, another one is survivability. And if you want a legacy tree, sure. you want to avoid planting something that just isn't going to survive. Oh, true. And also you have construction site location. There are places that might be absolutely perfect. You put too a lot, you just can't be at a cost in the excavation tearing up to plant a six inch versus what you could do with a four inch. So, okay. you know, holistically, it would be far more advantageous to us to consider the four inch in terms of what legacy really means. Sure, so you don't want to put something in that you're going to be taking down in two years or three right. years because it gets disease ridden because of lack of adaptability. So legacy has to do with more with species than with with size. Not thinking that the larger survivability in, yeah. in terms of survivability, Absolutely. because then you're going to be yeah. a less of a okay. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. 
Do you, and do you agree, Ingrid? Mm -hmm. And are you? I think, we do, I think we just don't want to go below that. Yeah. Below that threshold. <coughs> because I think we do want to put something in that's visible and makes a mark and has a head start. Right. And has a head start. So that's right. we don't want to put anything right. like this. <laughs> Um, I think that all the comments jointly make sense. Uh, are there any uh, abutters, members of the public, citizens that would like to be heard on this issue? Um, I'm not sure how to phrase what I, I think is a consensus developing here, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure how to phrase it. So I know you would prefer a, <coughs> that a legacy tree uh, defined species. as black species. What was it? Uh, legacy species. <coughs> black oak, hackberry, or red oak. Does that make sense to you, Ingrid? Because um, I, I think we did discuss that when the right. enforcement order was, was first issued. Um, and to ensure the survivability, we'd uh, be willing to reduce the size from uh, six inches to four inches with the idea that we'd get the largest survivable right. legacy tree. Right. Yeah. That language makes sense to you, so Kathy? Did a you minimum of four inch yes. and four inch to largest available. Within reason, or within, four to six, or something right, like four that. Four to six. Yeah. I think didn't we specify for the site that black oak was desirable for? Right. I yeah, believe it was. You agree with that, Steve? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. <laughs> that was the, 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 the way yeah. the order is written is for uh, an heirloom tree, and uh, verbally you, you had said a, a black oak tree would be preferable, and we have to. Judith, yeah. From the from the work we've done so far and the research, then they're scarce. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather just stick with the heirloom tree. In case we have to look for something Very, other than a right. black oak. Yeah. I think it's a black cherry. Was it? I don't know. No, no. It was a black well, I, the, the black, I, the black I cherry was the original black cherry twelve afterwards. Oh, on the And side. then when you changed, we went to the, we went to the black oak. So. All right. All right. So, um, with those conditions, anything else? Well, just in terms of balancing whether it's going to be a bank or whether you're going to, I mean, the financial side of it and how that plays out. But I don't think. I mean, I don't have a concern about that, but how you want to structure that. Uh, what's, what's the easiest? What's the path of least resistance? Because we don't have a place to plant them now. So would a credit be the, the way that you'd proceed on that? With, I don't, I don't, we don't care who it is, but right. it's just you, the, nursery. The idea is whatever it is, just have the credit available. And whether it's the commission or if you think, like I said, when the shade tree committee has their I work done, whatever yeah. way you want to phrase it, yeah. And they make those determinations. We just have that. We'd have that available for them. Cool. We'll go ahead and get them, and we'll get them delivered or whatever. You know, okay. that'd be the way. So it. then, Blue View would somehow write to us and say, "There's a credit here for five sure. heirloom trees." Yeah, we could, I'll work. I'll deal with them on that. Just to make sure that you have something in writing that we're doing what the order. All right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like the locality of your resource, I and mean, you could. Go to other places like Johnson and Cape Cod with its farms, tree farms. But that's a totally different sort. And that's what I was getting at with survivability. If you pull from the wrong location and you place it in another area. Can you say that again? If you, if, you, if you take it from one location and place it in an area where there's likely to be. Uh, adaptation problems, then you're running against the purpose of what sure. we're talking about altogether. So mm -hmm. I was just saying, having you know northern grown proximate <coughs> uh, consistency with soil conditions, environmental conditions, all the better for us. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you get all that, Kathy? No. <laughs> <laughs> An honest I'll, answer. I'll, that's good. But that's later. not part of the condition. Okay. <laughs> part of the condition was not. It's to the town, so if the park department had a spot or the cemetery had a spot, they can. Oh, it doesn't have to be the shade, shade tree okay. advisory. Okay. No, right. no, just you know, the, any any. Because I know a lot of people. Place. Well, actually, I think the shade tree advisory committee is actually looking to. Uh, both parks and recreation, uh, and to DPW as well as to where a tree is needed. Right. I know some streets are in need of, of, of trees. They're doing a survey. Yes. Yeah, doing, but yeah. I'm not sure. If, I know from DPW that general for DPW. I didn't know they were doing for the cemetery in the park. Oh, I don't know. I, why don't we leave it as as Generic any any town, town agency? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, to the town of Milton. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And now, is this a revisal of the it is enforcement order? Correct. It's a revised enforcement order. Okay. So if we could get an updated, yes, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, any comments from the public? Is that a motion with all those conditions that Kathy wrote down? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? All set. Great. You're good. good. Uh, these other issues, anything on these? Uh... Uh, no, the cut sheet, uh, I know you had a, a question on the cut sheet, and uh, when you first sent that in, this, for the public's benefit, there was an issue on um, the drainage system going through the foundation. And we were going to uh, approve the, the condition of the order of conditions was that we were to improve that plan. And then uh, the applicant came back and said, well, that's down the road. We haven't gotten there yet, and they need the, the order. So what we discussed was using a cut sheet, right. which was actually your suggestion. Which is, we're saying that's the product, the assembly we're going to use. Yeah, exactly. And we're fine with that. Right. And yeah. you, su you submitted it. I think I showed it to you, and it's, it's okay with me. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the language uh, for the demo orders? about uh, the transferability of the of the orders yes uh, I'd like it to match up with what we did for the special permit rather than uh, which is written notice rather than a vote of the Commission It'd be easier much easier for us to coordinate I thought that was changed not on the demos oh you're right it was yeah. changed on the mixed-use permit right and I just so want that we, same yeah, we can that's fine we can match because that's what our order of condition says that uh, at one time it said if there's a transfer of ownership, it would have to come back to us. They have to start all over again. Whereas all, all we need, and we, it, it's actually changed in the order of conditions that says that if there's a transfer of ownership, that the new owner has to abide by the conditions that were issued. Right. Yeah. So, but it's, so it's a notice issue. Right. Um, but it's, it, it's still, whoever's going to do it still has to abide by the conditions. order of conditions. Right. Correct. Right, yes, so we can change the order. Great, for both the towns. For both the towns and yours, that's great. great. That's perfect. Okay, okay excellent. So do do you get that? Those are the two demo uh, permits. So would that be an amendment on the two demos to change the language? Yes, and you're right. And you, uh, if you're getting to the point that we need to take a vote on that because the issue is whether or not that's a significant difference. If it's deemed to be a significant difference, then the applicant would have to refile, and, and the applicants, plural, in the town of Milton and, uh, and the Conleys would have to come back. If it's not a significant issue, then we can simply vote to modify. Sure. All right? So the first uh, question is whether or not, and there has to be a vote on this, as to whether or not the change in that language on the two demolition permits of just giving notice of this a transfer of ownership is, is not a significant issue. In conjunction with them following the conditions of the approved. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yes. 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 Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any, yeah, any, any owner uh, would have to abide by the uh, terms and conditions of the order of conditions. Sure. All right. So uh, is there a motion to approve that modification as being not a significant change to the order of conditions for both permits? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Done. Done. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Good night. Thanks. All right. Good night. Um, so, uh, do you have a vote also to amend both orders for the language to change, or is this fine? Isn't that what we just? No, that's what we just voted for. Just voted to change on. to change the language so that it's the same language in the permit that was approved uh, for the mixed use development. It'll track that, say, I, I think it's 43 special conditions. So that but if it's not 43, it's right around there. I would need to issue new, a new order of condition with the amendment. For that's the correct. Okay, that's, that's correct. Each, each one of those, all three of them are item 34. Oh, they're 34? Each one of them, yep. Oh, in, in the two demos and in the, in the order of conditions that we want to match up the language to. It's all special condition 34. They're all 34? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, so you, you know where to find those? Yes. Uh, they're probably right here, right? Okay. Yes. All right, great. Steve, okay. thank you very thank much. You. appreciate it. Sure, All right. Uh, next on the agenda is a request for certificate of compliance, Route 93 South on, on ramp at exit 3. Is anybody appearing for that, Kathy? Not that I'm aware of. All right. The, the, this is um, this is an odd. You really want to go there? <laughs> no, no. 
This is uh, for the public's benefit. Uh, the federal court actually ordered us to issue an order of condition. <laughs> we had denied it. Um, and then uh, there was a lawsuit that went from the U.S. District Court in Boston to the First Circuit, back to the District Court in, in Boston. Um, and then there was an order issued that directed us to issue the um, order of conditions for the, the uh, cell tower. Remo oh, the, oh, it's cell the cell tower. The cell tower. So we didn't have any option. But we did it at a public hearing. We issued the order. So now they're coming back with a certificate of compliance. And in the packet, there is a, uh, a PE stamp. This is um, uh, Pro Terra Design Group, LLC. And we do have a, um, a, a stamped uh, representation by uh, Jesse Marino. PE, managing partner at ProTerra, and it says a representative from ProTech Design Group observed construction during multiple phases of the project and visited the site on May 15, 2017 to verify substantial completion and earth stabilization. In our opinion, the construction is in substantial compliance with the design plans prepared by ProTerra Design Group, LLC. The attached as-built plan, designated AB-2, dated July 8, 2016, and photographs provided herein document the completed construction. So our, that's usually what we require. We can take a site visit if you want, but it, what I think I was, was there within the last month. Within the last month? Yeah, probably two weeks. All right. Maybe a little and, bit more ago. And it's in substantial compliance. They, yeah. All right. Exactly what they report. Any questions? Oh, any uh, about it, members of the public, citizens that wish to discuss? Uh, with that, uh, is there a motion to appro approve the certificate of compliance based upon the uh, professional engineer, Mr. Marino, his representation that is in substantial compliance with the plan? Such a motion? So moved. Second? Second. In favor? All right, unanimous. Done. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is. Uh, <laughs> extension request to order of conditions at 999 Randolph <laughs> Avenue. I'm having too much. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kelly Durfee Cardoza, and I represent Wollaston Golf Club. Um, I have with me Dave Dunell, who's the golf course superintendent. We were before you on July 11th to request an order, uh, an extension of order of conditions 46 40, 457 which included the bridge, the associated car path with the bridge, two tees, a car path on the second hole and on the eighth hole, car path along the 11th hole, associated tree removal, and the installation of underground power all at Wollaston Golf Club. The order was initially issued in May of 1998 um, due to an appeal, a superseding order of conditions. There's no way that's, I know this is 1998, <laughs> but there's like no way, guys. Something <laughs> happened in my office. <laughs> Due to an appeal, the superseding order of conditions was issued by DEP on August 7th of 2014. Um, wetland replication and tree planting was proposed as mitigation. Um, you might recall that there was an appeal of this order, um, and a a through the appeal process, which took a long time to settle, um, we came back and asked for permission to relocate the car path on 11. We saved two trees. We took a another couple of trees down and a, a dead tree as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what we're asking for you tonight is an extension on that. Uh, DEP has extended their superseding order. And so their superseding order um, was set to expire August 7th, which was yesterday. They've ex extended it for three years. So now we go to August 7th of 2020. So we're asking you if you would extend yours to match their, their date, essentially, so that we're running coincident because right now your bylaw order expires in November of 2018, and they haven't done all of the work, and they would like to have an opportunity to finish it. Does everybody have a, a memory? We did discuss this at the July, uh, the July meeting, and you have probably have a memory. I, of I remember, yeah, I remember July it before. July meeting in 1998. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> um, so uh, for, Members of the, the public, one of the issues was whether or not there's, there's an automatic extension uh, for all 
orders of condition that were issued between what, 2010 and 2013? Yeah. 12? 12. 12. Um, so we don't, we don't fall into that. Correct. All right. But it, it's, it's not unusual to come back and ask for an extension if the work hasn't been performed. And in this case, the reason the work wasn't performed because it was tied up in litigation. Right. And we just have the appeals court opinion uh, that came down um, uh, affirming the order, allowing you to go forward to do right. it. In June. Uh, June, right. Um, this year. But it's in, it, did everybody see it in our packet? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable uh, uh, extending the permit so that it's coterminous with DEPs. And, and we all have a copy of the uh, authorization signed by Rachel Freed on July 27, 2017, extending uh, the permit for Wallace and Golf Club. Yes. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Other abutters, uh, members of the public that would like to be heard or ask a question? Seeing none, is there a, a motion to uh, extend the authorization uh, for a period of time coterminous with DEP's extension? So moved. Second? Second. I'm going to abstain just because I wasn't here at the last discussion. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Good. One abstention. Unanimously in favor, though. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next one is Enforcement Order 531 Elliott Street. I don't get it. I don't remember what it was all about. They just made something. They it was going to And they got sued. They got sued. Yeah. I remember. Hey, good evening. What? Really? Yeah. Welcome. Are you surprised? Could you introduce yourself and. Uh, it took so long. Uh, you can tell us, or maybe <laughs> you can tell us what's going on at 531 Elliott Street. Uh, Lou McPherson, homeowner. Um, basically looking for a direction. At, the only, um, the goal was to uh, landscape our backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, not trying to disrupt anything, but uh, basically looking for direction, instruction as to what we can and can't do. Okay. Um, so we can notify you and so forth. I mean, I talked to a um, building inspector, uh, and basically it's not really under his jurisdiction. He like says, you know, basically I got to, you know, come forward and talk to you to discuss. So, okay. Um, it was just uh, <clears throat> the basic premise was that the previous owner had an above-ground pool left behind a big void. Uh, it's, pretty, it's a pretty fairly, you know, 20,000 square foot lot, and uh, we just wanted to landscape it with some perennials and, you know, make it, you know, get some useful life out of it, so, and plant sides, so, uh, tell right. me what to do or what I can do or what not to do so we can, sure. how, no, how to go about doing it the right way, you know. Can you explain? I, 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 did you already hear this last? No, week? no, we, we didn't. We've continued it. I think in June, um, uh, we had a report that there was an excavator or a bobcat or something that was regrading or putting, bringing in some fill. And there were two concerns initially. The first within our jurisdiction is if you're within 200 feet of the Neponset River, and I, I think you are. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's jurisdictional for us. So if you alter the elevation at all, uh, you have to come and ask uh, permission to do it. Um, and that sounds like form over substance, but it's important so that we, you know, we make sure that we maintain the, the uh, pristine nature of the, the Fawcett River, of the estuary, and, and the land surrounding it. Um, and then the second one, there was a question as to how much fill was being brought in, and that we do have a, the town does have a, uh, uh, a fill bylaw. Now, that's not our jurisdiction, but that, that goes to the building commissioner. Um, and I, I think that's been resolved that you brought in less fill than would require a special permit. So that, I think, is off the table. Kathy, am I correct on that? I believe so. Oh. I, I will check tomorrow okay. with the building department. I'll have to be sure. All right. I think the issue wasn't the amount of fill. It was the location of the fill. Okay. All right. Well, the location of the fill would, would be within our jurisdictions because if you're adding or subtracting, if you're altering the landscape at all within our jurisdiction. Um, you have to come and just tell us what your plans are, and, and uh, we're not tough to deal with. So, uh, and especially if you're going to beautify the yard, it, it, that would probably make sense. I know that I had a concern initially because I saw a picture. Kathy went down and took some photos, and there was a big uh, stockpile of, of fill. 
And the danger of that is that when the rains come, it all washes out and there's a lot of sedimentation and erosion. So uh, I think, wasn't there a, a request that you put a tarp on it or somehow control the sedimentation? Correct. Um, and, and then, and I don't want to speak for Joe, uh, but I did talk to him and I did give him an estimate in terms of what, what was brought in in terms of uh, for the building commissioner. So okay. I, did, I did reach out to him. And and how much, was, how much him. was it? I don't remember, um, you know, but it was, you know, not the huge, huge truckloads, but there were, there were truckloads, landscaping truckloads to bring in. Um, and then it wasn't leveled yet. So at the time they said, stop doing anything. So we didn't do anything. Okay. Uh, but, and then the excavator, the Bobcat's gone. Um, but it was just left. I just said, told them to just stop. Um, but I did have some questions in terms of oh, would a fence help? I, I understand about the silt and the, 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 the probably needing, you know, um, bales of hay along I, that I fence line. You know, I have I, a plot plan. Can can I, 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 can I, I I've got pictures, I think. Was that, were the pictures in on July? I see, so the they might be there. To, just a uh, couple questions. So um, you mentioned that there's a pool, there was a divot left by the pool, right? If that that's was what it is, that's something it. like that, yeah, right? An so, pool. and you and the goal was to fill, bring enough fill in to fill in the divot, or the goal was to bring in enough fill to level the backyard. To to do both, not level completely, but at least grade it down uh, because there's a, a significant drop off. From so it drops off to the train, to the train tracks. <sighs> well, the train's further, further way back, but um, I could kind of show you this way with the sure. plot plan. It kind of. Uh, so, um, this where, is where exactly is, is your, I mean, along Elliott Street, here, no, uh, along, are we at the Henry's end? I mean, I'm not sure where, what are we saying? What, it's I'm closer to 531? Blue House Parkway. Oh, Blue House Parkway. Um, oh, so you know we're near the river. So how is it jurisdictional? Why is it, it, it's it? What? actually closer to the Anthony House behind it. Oh, okay. Okay. This is unquoting. Is on this side. Is that the unquoting house? Yeah, that's the the high rise. The fifty-five. Yeah. Okay. So you actually back up to the back of that. Right. Okay. These are the pictures that were taken. It's a pretty steep slope. One of the problems that we have with grading, and you know, the pictures are kind of alarming to us because if if you build up the elevation over the, the base of the tree, right. the tree will die. Um, and it, it, just looking at those pictures. Uh, Th this first one looks like a huge amount of fill was brought in. I mean, is that representative of, of the condition? I mean, that looks like, you've, like a mul you know, a couple of feet of, and actually this one here is the same way. That one looks like multiple mm -hmm. feet of fill have been brought in mm -hmm. to, le to level the yard as opposed to just Regrade the yard. Well, at this point, it was built up so that they could bring it in, but it, w it wasn't spread. So we stopped spreading. It wasn't spread. So what we need uh, uh, is a a plan. Yeah. And we have, we'd to, have to have the, the elevations. Grade, right. The elevations and the grade changes. Right. Is it? I mean, you've got the plan. Is that from a, an engineer? This Do you have an engineer? This is a plot plan that, that we, that, you know, have. this is not a, it's a certified plot plan, but it's sure. not a, you know, and I'm talking to Kathleen just basically kind of, um, so where does the slope start? Because it looks like it starts right around well, where start, the garage yeah, it is. It starts there significantly, yeah. I mean, I'm... So you're trying to bring up the, the rear of the, the Mainly house? in here, you know, where the pool was. I mean, that's, that, was the real, uh, that was the real goal. Do you have any photos pre-dirt? I try. Because we're just trying to, we're trying to, what you're saying is that not much dirt has been brought in, but based on looking at these photos, it appears that a, a lot of dirt no, has been I, brought I, in? I didn't say not much dirt. But you said a couple I'd of trucks. Lying. I said... Double-digit trucks. I'm saying I'd be lying to you if I told you exactly how many trucks. Yeah, so I'm just um, trying to get a feel for it. Actually, yeah. we can have Alan Bishop take a picture because we had a flyover in 2012, yeah. and that will show you what we did with oh. town tree, being how it looks. Sure, right. 
and then Google it today. Maybe. Well, it might not be today, but you could at least get the contours. Yeah, that would be great. I can probably find pictures, uh, you know, about the house a few years back uh, of the pool. Yeah, or, that would be or, perfect. Or, uh, or they, they took down the pool, so after the pool was removed. Yeah. Um, what we're trying to do is get an understanding of what the contours were doing and what, right. what, how much dirt has been brought in. Are we talking about three feet of dirt or we're talking about six inches of dirt? And just and these photos appear to be more on the heavy end than on the light end. Oh, I, I don't dispute that, um, but can you tell me what I can do in terms of the left side, the back side? Um, Will a fence solve the problem in terms of? Uh, is, Probably is it not. It, it's more the grade yeah. okay. because it looks like there's a pretty steep drop off, and if you're using this as the backyard and then it drops off, it looks like you're trying to lift the backyard so you have more flat space. Um, and we'd have to have some kind of an engineering plan that shows us, you know, how you're changing the grade because the problem with this is that if you extend the backyard out um, laterally. When you get to the end, it's going to be it's going to be a real sharp drop off. That's almost impossible to hold, uh, and you're going to get all kinds of sedimentation, erosion, um, and you know sometimes you even have to put a retaining wall in. So it depends upon the grade change, but I I really think you're going to need a, an engineer if you're changing the, the elevation. A landscaping engineer would probably be very very helpful to you. He can provide yeah. that information and also give you some nice advice as to how to protect the trees so that you retain their life because they, from what I see, are a positive aspect of your property. Tree wells. Yeah. Okay, so a landscaping engineer to present a plan to whom? Or to, give it to, to us. Yeah, I'll give it to Kathy and then we put it on the agenda. I and mean, we, can, we can move pretty quickly on on this, so we won't we won't slow you down. You want an NOI? Sure. Yeah, that's pretty. That's, that a plan notice will be of, part intent. of the NOI, just so that the gentleman understands that it's not just having the plan, but the paperwork that would go along with the plan. Correct. Well, what's an NOI? What's a <laughs> notice of intent? It's called a notice of intent, and, and it, it describes the project. It describes the what the scope of the project is and the intent and all of that, and yeah. then yeah. Go ahead. If you want to, you can come and see me, and I'll help you fill it out, and what you need. Okay. And this protects you. So this is about <coughs> the land, not necessarily the boundaries. This is about the, the basic the elevation. It wasn't, it, we weren't trying to do anything as steep as what you described, but I understand it's about the, the drop-off, the slope. Right. I mean, you may go from a 3-to-1 slope to a 2-to-1 slope to a cliff. Uh, the further out you push it. Okay. Um, and then the, the, the steeper the drop, the more difficulty you're going to have retaining uh, that level because it'll just wash out. And, and I mean, a three to one slope is not impossible. You can put grass, bushes, shrubs on that to hold it. But you need some kind of a root system to, to hold the slope. Otherwise, it'll just slide down towards the river. And the landscape engineer and the landscape plan can help with that. They can identify the, the types of plantings that will best serve you and avoid the types of erosion that John is talking about. Yeah. That make that makes sense? Yes. I just have a question too in terms of any restrictions with the uh, the drain that did you take a picture of the drain? I have a picture. I think Is it the brook or whatever you're calling the drain is actually what we call a brook. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's a big deal. You can't fill in the brook. Okay. No, I didn't want to fill it in. I okay. um, wanted to put a bridge across it, but I want to clear um, the trees are falling on this left side of the uh, unit. I can't Unquity. Unquity House. Unquity House. So there are trees leaning over. I wanted to clear them. I wanted to cut them because they're, they're trees leaning from over. their property to yours or from yours to theirs. Yeah. Okay. So any restriction with that? Yeah, anything you do within our jurisdiction, you need permission for. If it's a public safety hazard, we're not going to give you a hard time. I mean, we're all for safety. Uh, but if you just come in and tell us what you want to do and take a picture of it, uh, we'll, we'll work with you. Okay. All right? So because safety is paramount for us. Okay. 
Right. What's that? So he's asking what the restriction is, and it's a 25 foot non disturbance. From the brook. From the brook. Yeah. Okay, but that's what he's asking. Oh, okay, right. So you, you want to know what are the restrictions off from re cutting the trees on the they're still on the property but on the left side of the brook, leaning over. So sure. so if it's a bad storm or whatever or something happens, you know that's where they park. Right. So I'm trying to avoid that, and I wanted to cut the trees. So right. and that's te te not twenty five feet away right. from the edge of the. Brook. So technically, the letter of the law is anything within twenty five feet of the brook cannot be modified. Meaning you can't add dirt, you can't cut trees down, you can't do any of that. The comment to that though is, if they're a safety hazard, we're, you come and tell us, like you are now, but okay. say, we have six trees in this area that we want to take down because they're a safety hazard, we're not going to be opposed to that. If we, if you agree. If, yeah, well, we, agree, if right. we agree, right, correct, if, if it's reasonable. And, um, <laughs> well, I, I shouldn't. So I have, a, I, ha I know the manager of the Uncle House really well. <laughs> <laughs> so if you need to, if you want to approach those from the other side, if that turns out to be the way to go, I'm sure that she would be amenable to trying to make that happen, move the cars and that kind of stuff. Okay. But, you know, so. Put you it should, in the NOI. Well, no, no, I'm just saying if, if it's a safety hazard and you're trying to take the trees down and trying to get to them from your side of the site, I'm sure that we can get the, get the can coordinate getting at them from the other side of the site. Okay. So, if I'm understanding correctly, prepare an NOI, a plan by a landscape engineer, present it. Yes. Wait for a response. We have a meeting. We have another meeting just like this. Monthly? Yes. Well, yes, but sometimes, uh, I don't know if we're going to have a site visit on this one or not, but we, we typically have two public meetings a month, one like this in the town hall. And then we typically go out into the town to do inspections. Um, and if, if we saw your plan, we'd probably want to go out and, and take a look to see it. So, you know, typically, you know, every two weeks or so we get together. All right, now our next official meeting, uh, we don't have a site walk scheduled yet, but our next meeting is, what, September 12th? 12th? I believe it's the 12th. 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 All right. So you can count on that. We just need to have the plans. You're supposed to give it to us seven days before the, the meeting. I wish people did that, but uh, just get it to us before the meeting so we can see it. I'm going to try and... Well, actually, I need it by August 30th. I would need to put the ad in the newspaper. Oh, yeah, that's right. I have to okay. do that a week before the meeting. Okay. So just give us a, a heads up. Um, if you think you can do it that fast. I would kind of need to find out where to find a landscape engineer. Um, not to sound naive, but I'm a city kid, so I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't, don't deal with this much, but. Um, well, you talk to Kathy. I mean, yeah, we deal with them all the time, so. Okay. We don't favor one over another. Yeah, no, no, but, I understand yeah, that, but I just want to, just want to get it done. Sure. You know, yeah. All right. So just in background, so the goal for the, for the yard is just a lawn for kids to play on? Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Just so, trying to assume where you're going. I don't want to disturb the waterway. I want to put a, a, a walking bridge over it, but as you see along the left side, there's a lot of overgrowth. Yeah. The tree sloping on, you know, over the cars. I yep. just want to beautify it. Yeah. So that's really it. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions? I mean, I, I don't want you to walk away and say, oh, geez, I should have asked. No, I think so. I can email you like last time, so. Yeah. Okay, that would be helpful. Yeah, stay in touch with Kathy, and then we you know, hopefully we'll see you on the 12th of September. Okay, so, all right. I'll try my best. To, I mean, I don't, I don't know how long this takes. I don't know. I, getting a survey took, took, took a long time, but um, at least I'll communicate with you if I can have anything by then. Okay, that's All right. great. All right, thank, thank, thank you very you. much for thank you. coming in. Okay. Uh, request for a certificate of compliance, 1035 Brush Hill Road. Two of them, actually. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Hello. Ned Corcoran with Dennis Cohane, who is the owner of the property at 1035. Brush Hill Road, and we have sort of parallel requests for certificate of, certificates of compliance. 
they go back, orders of conditions that go back to 2009 and 2010 uh, for work that was done. Um, Dennis purchased an old uh, dwelling that had a it's about two and a half acre property. He subdivided the property into two lots. Uh, there was an old concrete lined wetland uh, on the middle of the property. He essentially gut rehabbed the dwelling that was there, renovated it. There were two components. The first under Art item 46388 dealt with two things. One, he connected, he brought sewer in to serve both of the new lots uh, and we eliminated the old uh, cesspool septic system. In February, the, the commission issued a partial uh, certificate of compliance with respect to the sewer uh, installation work that was done. What remained on that one is uh, a, a component of the of the certificate of, of, of the, excuse me of the um, the order of conditions that dealt with the authorization to remove bittersweet vine, rose, buckthorn, poison ivy, and other things from vegetation within I think within the concrete line pond and area surrounding area. Yeah, that was done. It's been done for quite a while. But that remains an outstanding um, item from an existing order of conditions that we're requesting to be closed out. And I've given you a series of photographs that were sort of taken recently uh, of the area. The second, which is item 400, dealt with. Um, I thought I should each, should each have copies. This 400. Um, and then the second deals with work that was actually done on the house. There was corner of the house was within a hundred foot setback. Uh, that corner was demolished and, re and replaced. Um, and, and we think in accordance with the, with the order. The order of conditions itself is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Um, Thank you. And so um, the work has been done. The lawn has been graded. Um, all of the invasive species have been removed. The site looks beautiful. Thank really, you. Really, pull out all the, the stuff that's not supposed to be there and it fills in, right? I mean, right. really, really nice. Yeah. yeah. We ended up not taking really anything out of the, the concrete line pool. Yeah. Um, except for the invasive species. And yeah. It, it grew back beautifully. Yeah, it looks really, really nice. It's beautiful. Yeah. What was the issue with the house? That you said that there was an outstanding issue against the house? Not an issue against the house. It was an outstanding um, of no, of order of conditions sure. because the, the corner of the house was within 100 feet. We built an addition. Oh, addition. okay. That was, that was within 100 feet. That, that was within 100 feet. feet. It was just into 100 feet, Yeah, but it was within 100 feet. Okay. Um, they installed hay bales in accordance with requirement just to protect any runoff during construction, but otherwise it was done and the house is finished and um, we don't have, we don't have, I submitted with the earlier request sort of as built, but there's nothing, that, I don't have a certificate from an engineer that says that that work was done substantially in accordance with the order of conditions. Um, I mean, it was Can done. Can you get that? What's that? Can you get it? We, uh, that's what I was looking for, and I, we, I've got it for the uh, septic system. We did it for the septic. We were able to get the engineer who had done that to review it and issue a, a certificate of compliance with respect to that. Um, we had, don't have one uh, with respect to the, this, the construction of the, of the house itself. Can you get it? it it's, it, that is our requirement. Um, so that would be custom practice and regulation. Uh, is it, it doesn't sound like it's an issue. Um, Other than finding the guy who can do it. Um, but you know, Oak Engineers. Did you My last time. Yeah. Who did the. Um, Oak Engineers. Oak And en they're, they're going out of business. Oh, they have. Yeah. What, and what about. Mr. Oak, or Black Oak or Red Oak? <laughs> EJ, EJC. I don't know who EJC. Oh, Everett Chandler. Everett, is he is he around? 
He is, yeah. Yeah. Would I could get him, I guess, yeah. Right. The letter. Yeah. All it has to say is with his stamp on it that it's in substantial compliance with the order of conditions. Okay. I'll get that. All right. I mean I um and we got one for the similar for the um the septic, the sewer work. For the sewer work, yeah. I thought you had that one. We did have that one, and that was partial. The partial certificate of compliance was issued with respect to that. Right. And that was back in February. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's that simple. It just says substantial compliance with the order. Peter Gammy, actually, he's my engineer, too. Well, he can do it. This is the one he did. He did the one for the subject. Oh, yeah. But he wasn't the engineer for the... Um, for the house? For the house. Right. Yeah. Well, if, you, if you could get Everett Chandler? Yeah, I will. All right. That would... Uh, that'd be, I, I, don't, I don't think it's... Uh, it doesn't onerous. look like an issue. It shouldn't be onerous, yeah. And it sounds like it's form over substance, and I hate when I even sound like that, but it is the regulation. So if you could help us, I, I, I think we can... Take care of it quickly. Does anybody need a site walk for? I think the picture. Other than the fact that I'd like to walk around his backyard. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, then if that's the case, if, if there's no need for a site walk, if I could request that the commission issue the second certificate of compliance for number three eight eight, and then we'll come back in September, continue the four hundred to to September, and we'll get the uh, engineer certificate. And we'll ask the commission to issue the certificate. Can we do that contingent? Can we do them both now with the contingency that they're going to provide the letter? Because that that would be good. Yeah. Okay. You mean better? I don't know. Okay. I'm with I'm with Mike. Great. All right. Uh, any other questions? Um, members of the public that want to be heard or ask a question? <laughs> we need this two letters and two um, answers, correct? No, no, just on. Well, one we've got. When you have. Yeah. But just on 400. The, the landscaping, the plant and plan, there was. There was no. The first one. There is no plant and plan. Why was it? Why was the first one a partial? Because in February, um, it was winter. <coughs> so difficult to show from a photographic perspective um, what was happening with respect to the how the pond area had filled in sure. and so we requested that you continue it so the 388 was both septic and yes. invasive two, removal there were two components okay and we needed the septic because the the Kinsale the lane property which was the newer house that had been subdivided right. okay. uh, was was trading hands and it was a it was a cloud on title and we needed to clear that as part of that conveyance um, and so we got the engineer certificate, and you issued the certif partial certificate of compliance for that. That's been recorded. The property, that property has changed hands, and the set and the septic work was was outside of your jurisdictional area, and it was um, servicing predominantly, well, servicing both your house uh, at 1035 Bershaw Road, but also was servicing the new house at One Kinsale Lane, and so. You agreed to issue the certificate of compliance as a partial certificate to address that work, to address the title issue associated with the resale of the property at one can sale. Um, hadn't been picked up when Dennis conveyed originally to um, the Ambrose family. And so the, the only thing remaining then on 388 is it's the, it, it's the invasives. landscapes. The invasives. And we've got but you said that there's a think, landscape I think, plan? I think the order calls for landscape. I think Judith wanted to see it at the last week. That's why it was delayed, because she wanted to see the landscape plan. Look at the order of conditions. My recollection was we just rolled in the invasives, because that was the first one to be approved, right? We rolled that in to say, well, it was timely for you, because you had a crew on site that could do that work right away. Correct. And we just did. It just became part of it because it was something you wanted to do. Yeah. And there is no landscape plan. It, it's it's the way it it's the way it was forever. We just you removed the invasives and it's natural. Come on. Yeah, natural. Yeah. There is a condition number forty five. It says that his planting plan would be submitted by a David Burke. 
by April 25, 2009. Burke disappeared and he never prepared that plan. But you're saying that you never planted anything, so it's irrelevant. It's the way it was 100 years ago. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Except without the invasive species. <laughs> All good. Yeah. Which weren't there 100 years ago. <laughs> True. You sure? <laughs> <laughs> I can remember. Them, so. <laughs> What's the number on it? Condition number 45. And the order of conditions. Mr. Burke shall provide a replanting plan by April 25, 2009, for review and approval by the Milton Conservation Commission. The applicant shall provide the credentials of Mr. David Burke, wetland specialist, is 44. The applicant may begin removing bittersweet vine, multiflora rose, glossy buckthorn, and poison ivy. The applicant may not remove any trees from the area. The conservation agent shall visit the site to ensure compliance. Um, so we don't we don't have a a plan, but was I I'm I'm trying to remember back to two thousand nine and I remember being there. But and I remember saying take the vines out, you can you yeah. can do that. I, I remember that. I, I remember that too. Yeah. But I think the comment about uh, we should just recognize that no planting was done and that the comment about requiring a planting planting plan is irrelevant. But I think Judith wanted to see it. But there isn't one. We haven't seen the site. Yeah. She wanted to see the site, right. is oh, what you no, said. No, oh, no, she no. wants to see the site. She wants to see the site. Oh. What was supposed to be made so she could see it. But I don't She know. wants to walk in your backyard. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's welcome. I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I understand. <laughs> I don't disagree with her. Um, you want, it can be contingent on Judith walking the site in the full way. Okay, right? In yeah, the same way as that, right? I, right. I just don't remember the site. I think she has been. But she wasn't hung up on the plan. She just wanted to she verify. She wanted to get the, the, the She wanted the site walk. I think that's a reasonable approach. Yeah, yeah we, we can make it contingent upon her review and approval. Right. Um, all right, so let's do them uh, separately then, one at a time. So that's 388. Well, report, it be What's that? Because only the commission as a whole could approve. I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, one individual can't approve. It would take all of us to approve. Oh, she'd have to report back to yeah, us. So yes. No, you, you, you are correct. I Subject to sure. verification by Judith. Does she still need to? Well, one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get to go with her. <laughs> you get reactivated. <laughs> all right. So we, on, the, on the partial, this is 388, and that was the partial approval that we did in February for the septic system. The only component was missing was the uh, the planting plan, which we don't have, and subject to the you know inspection by Judith, um, and then report back to us. It would be contingent upon our acceptance of what we see in the photographs. That is the removal of the invasives. Right. So, with that condition, uh, are there any comments or make that a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay. So that takes care of 388. Uh, with respect to the 400 one, uh, what's, what's your level of confidence you get Mr. Chandler to give us a PE stamp saying that the house was built within... I'll get we can wait. What's that? I'll get somebody. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, we'll we get can, somebody. Can we make that conditional um, on I, receiving it? I think it? so. I yeah. mean, I'd, to require them to come back just to give us that letter seems silly to me. I, I just won't release the um, certificate until we receive it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's true. And we need an as built also, correct? We, did, we yeah, submitted yeah. an as built subdivision plan that was dated October 2, 2014. It doesn't, but it doesn't refer spe specifically to the work done under the order of conditions. There is a plan that shows uh, the house, the dwelling as it was prepared. Is there a stamp plan? Yes. What's, what's the date on it? Have the as 
if, as long as that's appropriate, as long as that's. Well, that is the as built plan, right? It's an as built plan, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it was an as built easement plan. Complied with all the conditions. Right. Do we, is that in? I submitted that, a copy of that, with the request for the certificate of compliance. It was attached to the oh. request for the certificate. When did, when was the original submission on this? 2009 and 2010. How long have I been on the commission? <laughs> yeah. Not long enough. Time flies. <laughs> Not long enough. I, I don't see it as part of this. I, I've got your letter. No, I submitted uh, separately um, and. Can you resubmit it with the letter? You. Yes, I can resubmit the plan with the letter. With the letter. And that'll that back in February? Submitted it in January for the February hearing. Okay, that's why we don't have it. Because it's still, I mean, the folder has, should have. But that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. But just, if they, the, you have it, just resubmit it, a yeah. fresh copy I with submitted the letter. submitted the Form 8A request for certificate of compliance and I attached to it. No, I'm talking about the as-built. The as-built. It's an as-built slash easement plan. It was dated October 2, 2014. It was prepared by Everett Chandler. It's hard to believe that was eight years ago. I mean, I remember, I'm serious, I, I, I could believe it was a year or two ago. I can tell you tonight what happened that day. Hmm. Can you? Scott Brown got elected. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a pretty other Okay. Yeah. And that was that long ago? Yeah. <laughs> He's come and gone. <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I haven't seen it yet. It's all right. They'll, they'll submit a new copy. <coughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't have that in here. I've already gone through that. We're the only ones left. We can go, right? No. <laughs> well, wait a minute. No additional business. It's, it's attached to that. Do we? Ah, ah thank you. <laughs> you seem to be taking pleasure out of that. It's nice to you back here again. You can't get up this soon. Oh, I didn't even notice what time it was. This is like a record, record meeting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this is a show. It's, it's not even one yet. <laughs> well, this, um, this is an as-built plan for... It's an as-built plan for the subdivision itself shows the location of the of the house as it had been reconstructed and it shows the new house that one can sail under construction that was that plan was produced specifically for the revision to the subdivision that was approved by the by the um, planning board and had to go back to the planning board for modification um, and that was done over the course of 2015 and 2016. All right, so that if he can use this plan, um, yeah, I don't see why not. He chose the boundary of the white line, the area of the addition. But for 400, it doesn't show the construction of the, the building. Isn't that what this is on this end? That's the addition, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Right? That's the, the footprint of the addition. Right. That, the T-shaped thing on this side. Correct. 
-hmm. Well, yeah. it, it says it's the as-built foundation and utilities on the locust property. Okay, but it's a certified plan, so mm. and it's for the whole subdivision, right? Yeah. I, I, I think it's acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Are you, um, Arthur? Do you want to take a look at this and see if we can uh, operate on this basis? It, it's not the it's not the building up, but it's the foundation plan. So it, it's it's the locus which is important to us, I think. Right. Assuming that you have a certificate of occupancy that the building's not going to fall down. <laughs> what do you know that we don't know? Oh, I, no. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm just saying that this is the locus of the foundation as opposed to the structure itself. Oh, yeah. You're looking for contours? Yeah, well, do you need that on as built? No, I mean, I don't, I don't think we do. It's really just, it's distances. I mean, it wasn't out, of, what the, the revisions to the property weren't, weren't about recontouring within I mean, the scope, know. within the scope of our, there was no grading around the existing house, right? No, right? It's All as existing. As, as it, yeah. Yeah, this this I'm is the uh, well, you know, but it we do have see that the distances aren't, aren't reflected on this on this plan. I would feel more but comfortable as most of the most of what we're talking about is the existing house, the existing footprint of the house. The part that we're talking about is this portion over here. Over here, I thought it's it's over this, it's this section here. That's uh, that's the existing house, right? And this is a new house. No, no, no. That's the new house. This is the existing house. That's the addition to the to the old house. So it's this end down here, is the addition. Hmm. So the bulk of what you're talking about is the existing house, and that was never that wasn't changed. Is that? Is that correct that the, the I thought Connect the house came, yeah, yeah, the, I thought the house came down, they just don't, they don't look the same. I thought this was the existing house that was re, re, re furnished, uh, renovated. No, this is, uh, this is, this, more, is, this is more accurate, this one. Yeah, but this, this the, is the existing house. That was renovated. Correct. Yeah. And then we added this. And because this, I guess, from here to here measured less than 100 feet. Right. That's why we That's the issue. Here. Right. And, it, and this, is, this whole end of the house was just a renovation. Yeah, that, that's all existing. So all we're talking about is the thing that was added. So to it was end. really just this front porch here to the, to the pond. It would be in, in this area here. It would be in this area, correct. Okay. And yeah. because of that, I think that this is a drawing. And this is to scale. So this is to scale. Yeah. So... And, it sh and the fact that this shows the wetland boundary is, to me, is what makes that acceptable. If it was missing the wetland boundary, then I would agree that this is not appropriate. Right. But it does. Gotcha. Okay. You okay? You all right with that? Yeah. Yes. Arthur? I did, did you see the comparison here? Yeah, I can see. Okay. John, okay. it was just this corner here. Yeah. Really? Gotcha. This, okay. The line actually went Don't around. Don't turn past that, and that's the corner that shows okay. up. Yeah, no, I can, I can see. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's the corner that shows up in the photographs. Yes. All right, so then based upon this as-built plan, in comparison to the, uh, the original plan from 2010, um, are you com everybody comfortable that that's sufficient to... And this is our record copy? This yes, This is our is. file copy, so we don't, that's need, the file we don't need them. Correct. All right, and this is stamped by um, Everett Chandler. Everett Chandler, uh, October second, two thousand fourteen. All right, is that sufficient? Just for me. All right. So, is there a motion to issue the certificate of compliance? Okay, so yeah. but we still need the letter, correct? Yes. Yeah, it's still contingent upon the letter that it that it, it's built in substantial compliance with the order of conditions. Correct. Right. That, that's correct. All right. With that condition, though, is there a motion to approve the? Certificate of compliance. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? All right. Good. Thanks. But we'll, but she won't issue it until we get the letter. Okay. Perfect.
All right, good. Thanks for uh, your Thanks. patience with this. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoy your yard. It looks. It does look beautiful. You should stop. It looks really, really beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. I don't know where the name of the. Where's this kid sale come from? <laughs> you do right. <laughs> How's this, Greg Manat? <laughs> Thanks. Oh, again. he didn't know. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. So we're done. Uh, yes. Well, no, not exactly. Uh, we do have some additional business, but it'll only take a sh very short period of time. Do we do we have the the pictures from Kathy? Do you have the pictures from the the last the five thirty one Elliott Street? Okay, I I just don't want to lose those. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there was no little dirt there. Yeah, it's huge, and, and you said that that wasn't enough dirt to to break the threshold for the town. That's what I heard from the I, town. You look at that dirt. That that looks like a lot. That looks I, like I a think huge it's, it's there a thousand of yards that you need a. Um, yeah, that needs a sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. I think it does. Okay. But um, do you want to do it before? Um, be, before he comes back with a plan. Yeah, I think that would be helpful, John. Really. Or oh, we could wait and have the plan at the meeting, do the site work, and then make and then the decision on site. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, I think that would probably be more. more I think so. In our interest, in his interest. It sounds like he was trying to bring up the yeah. right access to the kind of level the backyard. Yeah. 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 Which is going to make it awfully steep. It's already steep. It, yeah. <laughs> it's going to get steeper. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. And um, I don't see the fill, too. Right? Oh, it looked like clay. Yeah, it looked like, it looked like clay. It did. Yeah. All right, now we had uh, two other agenda items. Yeah. Uh, one is request for compliance, uh, 333 Hillside Street. That was continued at the request of the applicant in writing. Um, and the other one was a request of certificate of compliance, 610 Brush Hill Road. Uh, that's also uh, requested by the applicant. So those are continued until September. Okay. And then on additional business, um, I, we received notification uh, appropriately uh, from Todd Hamilton about beginning construction at the Wentworth Home Project uh, off of Hillside Street. It's actually off of Ford Ranch Road. There was a meeting scheduled for today, and Kathy was in attendance, along with uh, two people from DEP. Uh, Lenore White uh, was a wetlands specialist hit, you know, for the applicant for Todd Hamilton. And then in addition, um, Jeff last name I can't recall is the engineer Kane, Kane yes Jeff Kane uh, who's the engineer for the project was present the the one issue that came up uh, was where they're gonna store the excavator they're, they're right. starting construction and it appropriately notified us uh, as the order conditions uh, required the and the, the question became where do they store the excavator because it's got uh, metal treads yeah. and you can't take it on a street um, so it'll tear up the street so with the DEP person in charge of water quality, President, it was his recommendation, and uh, I should have it here. Uh, Kathy, I know you gave it to me. <laughs> Can't be far. <laughs> you seem to have yes. an issue today. <laughs> I know, I know. Notice of decision. Uh, where did it go? He is suggesting in any event, this is it here. All right, this comes from uh, Gary Bogue, B-O-G-U-E, um, at DEP, to Kathy, copy to Jeff Kane. Uh, this is a pre-construction meeting, Wentworth Farms Estates. It says, hi, Kathleen, this is just to confirm that what was agreed on the site visit today, that under the water quality certification, I approved the applicant's request to leave the excavator on site in the buffer zone overnight until the span has been in place. The buffer zone extends across Ford Ranch Road into the adjacent properties. The machine will be parked at the entrance to the site on the proposed drive off of Ford Ranch Road. An oil absorbent roll will be placed around the machine each night. Refueling and lubrication of the machine will be done on Ford Ranch Road. All right, so that's, that's the DEP approval. Uh, we have a regular boilerplate that you can't store construction equipment within the buffer zone, right. um, but there's no place to put it. Right. 
if it were to be carted out there each day, it's, apparently it's a 92,000 pound um, machine. And uh, it would only limit the, the uh, work hours to like two to three hours a day, right. which would extensively you know, extend the project, right. um, which is not in our best interest because if it rains, they've got to get the equipment out of there fast. Right. Um, and this is for the bridge work to go over the stream. So I, I, I think that with everybody participating, uh, as I said, Kathy was there, DEP had two people there, the engineer, and, I, and I, I don't see any other alternative to allowing them to park the machine as DEP has instructed. But does anybody have any other ideas? There, there is a spill response plan uh, in addition to what he required here. That's the absorbent role surrounding the machine <coughs> in case there's any popping of a hydraulic line or, or spillage of fuel. Um, it should be contained, but in addition to that, there is a spill response um, protocol in place. That's the only equipment that would be there? Yes. There's another one on the other side, but that can be parked up gradient, upland, okay. uh, because it's not tearing up anything other right. than you know, the soil. Uh, so that they can just drive that one up and out of the, the buffer zone. But the one that's going to be within the buffer zone is on the Ford Ranch Road side, and we don't want that machine crossing over the stream. Right. It'll, it'll, with the steel treads, it'll tear up the, the yeah. stream. All right, so I just wanted to make sure everybody was comfortable with that. I think it's a responsible request. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. All right, that was my additional We're done. business. We're done. Yep. <laughs> anything else for additional business, Kathy? No. No? Anything else? So we, okay, so we can move to adjourn. So move. All in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you.